Good morning to you. It's um, just really starting to get light here uh, this morning in the church, and um, I've had to find myself a little nook and cranny here to uh, deliver this so that I've got enough light. Um, if you're living in a, a Western country, perhaps, uh, I, I don't know how many of them are, there are in the East, actually, but um, you may, of course, know of the existence of something called the Salvation Army. Well, it's existed for about 125 years, and um, it's grown from uh, being just a small organization to, to something worldwide. And it's, it's an organization that's very much concerned with the uh, helping people in terms of um, alleviating poverty and, and doing good works. And uh, they go around and they collect money. They have a magazine called The War Cry. They wear a special uniform, you've probably seen it, it's got an S on the epaulets. And uh, I was speaking to a young man the other day, actually, and uh, I was asking him about it. He was doing a collection for the army, and uh, I said, how come you belong to this? And he said, well, it's, uh, he liked the order, and he liked the uniform, and most of all, he, he liked the fact that it was practical, that it was helping people. And uh, he felt that a lot of the institutional churches were just basically, well, there just to, to fix up the new roof and that kind of stuff, you know, getting finances for all kinds of things. I could understand that, but um, I could also see that he enjoyed the discipline of, um, of the whole situation. And he was ranked in a certain way. And I began to think about God's army, the real Salvation Army. And uh, I've got some scriptures I'd like to share with you this morning. And the first one is this, that's Psalm 144, verse 1. And it says this, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Or other version says he trains my hands to war. And I thought about the last day's army, which is what the title of this, this video is all about. The people in the last days, what kind of people are they going to be in? those in Christ. We need to be people that are trained, trained to know the enemy's strategies, trained to know the enemy's ways, his little secret cunning methods of trying to trap us. We're in an army. That's basically what I'm trying to say this morning. And um, it's interesting that they include fingers in this, isn't it? He trains my hands, but my fingers they all have a, an individual little work to do, don't they? What can we do with our fingers? We can write. We use it to hold a spoon. We also hold, we use it to, uh, well, we use our hands, don't we, to, to do pretty much everything. We uphold the weak with our hands. We can help people along. Do all kinds of things. Get people into a firm grip. And our hands are the most useful thing, probably, on our body, besides our feet. Um, in terms of movement, in terms of being able to operate as human beings. 2 Timothy 3, and uh, I'm looking at verses... Sorry, let's just back up a bit here. I'm looking at 2 Corinthians 10.4. 2 Corinthians 10.4. I want to illustrate what I'm saying here, really, this morning. I've got several scriptures, so forgive me if I'm fumbling a bit. 2 Corinthians 10.4. And it says this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our weapons are not the same weapons, are they, as armies fight with? Yes, God gives us the power to fight, but we don't have carnal weapons. We're constantly told, aren't we? We're constantly warned that God has a way of using us of using us and training us in this battle that we fight against the devil every day. And because it's not a carnal weapon, we know too that the enemy is not carnal. He's spiritual and demonically spiritual. More scripture, 2 Corinthians, sorry, 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. And this is probably at the basis of what I want to say, really. 2 Timothy 2. 3 to 4. 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 to 4. Thou therefore, my son, 
be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. See, we're soldiers of Christ. We're in an army. We need to understand the discipline of those who have been put above us in not necessarily say the word above us but certainly overseeing us those that have got the gifts of pastors and teachers you could say in a way the ranks and that God has given us also a place hasn't he in his army and yet he wants us to be good soldiers he wants us to operate within his power he wants the type of soldier that has his weapons at hand ready to, to battle at any moment and most of all because the battle isn't fleshly it's a battle in the mind so he wants us to have the right mindset to fight a wrong mindset and i've written this down here a wrong mindset causes cowardice causes weakness and the battle is lost before a soldier can properly engage the enemy we can't engage the enemy with a wrong mindset Paul says, doesn't he, in Romans, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. There's a preparation for being a soldier. In Ephesians 6, 1, Ephesians 6, 12, is a clear verse, and it says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, Yes, we've heard that verse so many times, haven't we? But yet the devil tries something on with us on this. He tries to convince us that we're actually fighting flesh and blood. And very often when we differ with people and um, we don't walk in harmony with one another, we tend to forget that the devil is very often behind the powers that work against us. The spiritual forces tend to get forgotten about. Remember, one of the devil's biggest tricks is to make us believe that he doesn't exist. Well, it's very much the same on a smaller scale. And it's the same with regard to the kind of um, way that he operates in his demonic forces. We do fight the spiritual forces. We don't fight flesh and blood, and we sometimes need reminding of that. An obscure scripture here, um, I just want to share with you, is Nahum, one of the minor prophets. And um, he's talking here very much about um, the punishment of Judah and Israel and how God sends fearful armies against their enemies. And um, he says here in, um, let's just get the verse, verse 3 in chapter 2. He says here, the shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in scarlet. The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. And the fir trees shall be terribly shaken. And I thought about the word preparation in, inside that um, scripture. And I thought, yes, God is preparing us, isn't he? Training our hands for war, as I just read earlier. And how does he do that? The preparation inside a Christian it's the preparation of character, the development of how close we can resemble our Lord and walking in his army. If you think about armies, they walk in ranks, they march together, each one submitting to the other. Yes, and we, we don't think of it really as total control. We just think of it as an order because we know that without military order, you can't win a skirmish, you can't win a battle. I remember um, the situation, I think it was in Dunkirk in 1940, 41, when um, the British troops, the Allied troops, landed on, uh, on the beaches uh, at Dunkirk. But they weren't ready for battle. They couldn't fight Hitler. And they didn't realize that they were actually going to meet with the enemy on the other side. The enemy was there waiting for them. And all they could do was turn back. And by the grace of God, I think it was Winston Churchill, they sent out something like, I don't know how many hundreds of boats to pick up something like 300,000 men. 
and returned them back to the shores of, of the UK. And they were able to do that with safety, but they weren't ready. They weren't prepared for that battle. And so they had to turn back. And of course, the enemy wants that for us, doesn't he? He wants us to turn back as quickly as possible. And um, I want to look this morning at um, another piece of scripture. If I've got the sheet in front of me, just give me a moment. Judges 7 to 8 looks at the story of Gideon and Gideon's army. I just want to share a few thoughts on, on this and just read through this chapter. And uh, I've got some notes written down here and um, we'll see what the Lord gives us. Early in the morning, it says here, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Harod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Moreh. And the Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me, and they would say, My own strength has saved me. So he says, Announce to the army anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. And this is amazing because it says here, 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. That's an awful lot of fearful, cowardly people, isn't it? Turning back. And it begins to make me think about the army of God. I've got some points written down here, and I've said that God's army isn't about strength in numbers. That's not the way God works. He wants us to trust in him no matter how many enemies are against us, no matter how much difficulty we're facing. He doesn't want too many men fighting at once. He wants the right number of men, no matter how small, trusting in him. Remember what he said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. So he goes on, verse 4. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. Interesting translation, I will thin them out. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. And if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. See, Lord, the Lord knew every individual heart. He knew who was capable of fighting in that particular skirmish. And God knows us too as individuals. He knows our individual heart going on here. So Gideon took the men down to the water. Then the Lord told him, Separate those who lap with water with their tongues as a dog laps for those who kneel, from those who kneel down to drink. And 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. And all the rest got down on their knees to drink. Now there's a lot of theory about why the Lord chose the lappers and what actually the reason was for all that. And there's quite a bit of controversy. And some people think that those that knelt weren't actually looking around themselves to see if the enemy was about, that they were careless soldiers in some way. And so God chose these ones because they were particularly alert and aware. I don't know. I really don't know. But God separated them. And look how many. Only 300 out of 10,000. That really makes me think. Going on, verse 7. The Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. 300 men. Let all the others go home. That really struck me. Just go home. You know, work from home. Sit on your laptop. Don't worry. Everyone, there's a, there's a few people out there that will fight the battle. The rest of you can stay at home familiar so Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home but kept the 300 who took, took the, over the provisions and the trumpets of the others they took even that which the others couldn't use because they, they were sent home the trumpets all the resources were given to those 300 let's just go on here so God knows who he can use doesn't he through testing it's quite interesting and he's doing the same separations today. Let's read on. Now the camp of Midian lay below in the valley. And during that night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I'm going to give it into your hands. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Purah. 
and listen to what they are saying. Afterward, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So the Lord knew the heart of Gideon. He knew that he was a brave soldier, and he knew that his men were brave. But at the same time, he was also aware that there was fear inside them. And sometimes God makes provision for that. Yes, sometimes he just says, I know that you're prepared to do my will, but I also know that you're a bit fearful. So therefore, he gave them a way out slightly, didn't he? He said to them, you can go, go, go ahead and just go and listen to their conversation. And God had planned this out, hadn't he? Because if you listen on here, it says, and so he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outposts of the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all other eastern peoples had settled in the valley thick as locusts. These were thousands of people. Yeah? Their camels could no more be counted than the sand of the seashore. Now, if, they, if the camels couldn't be counted, can you imagine how many people there were? So it goes on. God, as I said, he knew their natural fear, and he made this provision. And Gideon arrived. This is the timing of God. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling his friend his dream. And he was saying to this man, I had a dream. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Martin Luther King, I had a dream. <laughs> he was saying, a round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. And his friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelite. God hath given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. He even heard the enemy declaring the victory of God. Now, you can't get better confirmation than that. So they were really prepared for defeat, weren't they? They weren't going to have to worry now. They'd heard it from the mouth of the enemy that they were, the enemy themselves were going to be defeated. And so if God speaks so clearly, we've got nothing to fear, have we? He even allowed Gideon to eavesdrop on their conversation. Perfect timing. Let's just go on here. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. What did he do? He bowed down and he worshipped. This is the good soldier, isn't it? This is the soldier that is keeping his eyes on the Lord. He bowed down and worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies of a 100, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hand of all of them with torches inside. It doesn't say he placed swords in their hands, does it? It doesn't say he placed clubs in their hands, or today guns. He placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. They knew that, that victory was sure. That they didn't need weapons of war to fight the victory. Listen on. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. And I, when I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. I like the acoustics in here. And so they hold no swords, and in they go. Gideon and the hundred men with him reach the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets, broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars. Grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands, the trumpets they were to blow, they shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. The army ran away. You see, the enemy's a coward. He can't stand in the power of God, can he? And so it goes on. Last verses. When the 300 trumpets sounded... The Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. Not only did they run, they got so confused they turned on each other. God brought about confusion and fear on each other. And the army fled to Beth Shittah, towards Zerah, and as far as the border of Abel Melah near Tabath. And so 
Gideon had his victory. Wow, isn't that an incredible victory? To think that that's how God works. That's his power at work within us. So, the wonder of God was at work. I want to finish with a, a scripture here. This is the words of Jesus in Matthew 26. And he says here from verses 52 to 56, this is what Jesus confirms about being a good soldier of Christ. Then Jesus said unto him, this is when Peter struck off the ear of the, uh, the servant. Do you remember that when they were in the garden of Gethsemane? And Jesus said unto Peter, put up again thy sword into its place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to the Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? And so that was how it was. And of course we know that the, uh, the soldiers came, as it says, in the same hour and said to Jesus to the multitudes, are you come out as a thief, as against a thief, with swords and staves for to take me? And Jesus goes on, doesn't he? He sees the, the carnality of the, uh, the soldiers coming with swords for Jesus. But as Jesus said to Peter, put away your sword. And as he said to Gideon, you don't need a sword. All you need is 300 men and a torch and a pitcher. And I will do the delivering. And that's my encouragement this morning today. And as we think about the Salvation Army, what is the true Salvation Army? We're all in the Salvation Army, aren't we? Whether we wear a uniform or whether we don't. And um, God's calling us to take up the pitcher and take up the torch and not worry. Lap the Spirit, cup it with our hands and take in the power of God as we go out serving him. Have a blessed day.